is the first personal finance book I've ever read. I picked it because the author, Monica Hallen, is a journalist I much respect for her domain expertise, her candor, and her ability to connect with the extraordinary financial challenges that ordinary people like you and me face. It's a great book, except I hated reading it because with every page I was reminded of how little I had thought about all of this, how much work I still had to do, how much time it was all going to take, and how behind I was. And I suspect that will be your reaction as well when you get your hands on this book. How did we get here, you and I? How do we get out of this? Well, let's talk money with Monica Hallett. Monica, thanks very much for being here on Bloomberg Quint. Thank you. Why is it so difficult? <clears throat> how did I get here? How do I get out of this? And is it just me? No. So the good news is, Menika, it's not just you. So the book has just about reached people through Amazon and through uh, store sales. And the reactions are beginning to come into me. And there, a lot of them are similar to yours. It is such a depressing book. Uh, all my money is in FTs and EPF. Where were you in 2008 when <laughs> I needed this book? <laughs> It's a good question. It's too late for me or what do I do now? You know, so it is really it's sort of waking people up and saying, my goodness, it's not that tough. I wish I had begun earlier. So mm. you're not alone at all. And it's not a woman yeah. thing either. It's no, not a single no. working woman thing. Because I've often wondered, no, no. we grew up in a society that doesn't talk money directly to women much, right? We're not taught to think of careers from the time that we grow up. Uh, most of us, at least from my generation on, have muddled into it in some way or the yeah. other. People don't talk hardcore money with you. People don't say, hey, have you thought through what you want to be earning, right. how you want to be saving, mm -hmm. investing? And then you sort of you know, stumble upon all of this as right. you grow up. Right. And then you come upon this book and you say, <laughs> golly, what yeah. was I doing what for 20 doing? years? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, nothing prepares you to look after your money. So if you remember school and college, it's all about the grades. It's about getting through the education and then getting a good job, mm. right? So and when you get the good job, it's about money coming in and the good life. So no one sort of reminds you that there is a purpose to the money. You will at some age stop earning the money. And then what happens? And also as you go along, there are needs. People have families, you have children, you have emergencies, you have a whole lot of things that you have to plan for. So it's, it, I, I would disagree with the fact that it's a single woman reaction. Okay. I'm getting this reaction from across the board, from much older men who are in very senior positions. Really? Who should have known better. Um, I thought men were always smarter with their money, no? Uh, no, so sometimes you sort of just leave it to your banker, bad idea. Hmm. Or you leave it to uh, your CA, even worse. Because what you actually need is a financial planner. Hmm. And uh, no, so people are not really prepared. In fact, I've seen uh, the women who get it become excellent planners of their own finances and for their families. The downside is that the one job that men were supposed to do, they let go of that as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, well put. You know, uh, in the many years that you've done this, yeah. what, two decades now, uh, have you seen approaches, at least in India, we'll confine our conversation to, uh, India. You know, to India, have you seen approaches to money change? Or have they stayed yeah. the same? Do you run into people like me every day, irrespective of the year, irrespective of the city, irrespective of the time of day, who say, hey, I've put this off for so long now, and you know, I don't think I'm doing anything with my money that's useful? Yeah. So I think the 40s and the 50s generation, people in their 40s and 50s, is that uh, you know, the, uh, just before the millennials came, it is that generation. So I think this is the generation, and we are part of that, which was the transition from mm. the pre-liberalization into liberalization. So some of our attitudes are still sort of on the cusp. What do I do? Is equity risky? But you know what my dad always did, FTs and real estate and gold, mm. so maybe I should too. But when I look at the millennials, it's a very different feeling. They're far more on top of taking risk with their lives and their money, mm. so both. Uh, so it is really a generational change that I'm seeing. Okay, so it is yeah. changing. There were three things you said in your book in similar places and separate places that I put together that sort of described, I think, the reasons I thought I had stayed away from all of this for the longest time, right? Um, and it was a moment of truth, really, because mm -hmm. you, you think you're not doing this because you're busy with work. Yeah. You think you're not doing this because you've got other important things to do. You think you find all, every available excuse yeah. in the world for not doing this till you realize that the only reason you're not doing this is because of this weird ingrained fear of failure. So the three things that you write about, and I'm going to list all of them now. I'm a money dummy. Mm -hmm. I don't really get this. This is too complex. 
I'm not sure I'll get it right. What if I find a better investment? I'm picking between A, B, C, D, E, F. Right. Am mm -hmm. I making the right choice? The insecurity in having made the wrong choice, right? And the third, what if I make a mistake and I end yeah. up with nothing, zero? Yeah. Isn't it better just to put my money in a savings account sure. or a fixed sure. deposit where yeah. I know it'll be relatively safe? Right, right, right. Now you've really got the problem where uh, almost perfect is the enemy of good mm. because we are seeking for this perfect product, this perfect return, this perfect highest return. We sometimes let go of what may just be good and not perfect. But having said that, these are all valid concerns and it's actually a very good place to begin with. Okay. And I'm going to sort of unpack a little bit of why we feel like that. And I'm okay. saying that it's the most logical, human, natural thing to feel because of the way the markets have changed. So if you remember before 1991, mm. the government took the entire risk onto itself. It set interest rates. It told you uh, what you would get back even in the stock market, there was somebody called a controller of capital issues yep. who would fix IPO prices. Yeah. Okay, so the government took all the risk on itself. Post-91, markets began to open up. Hmm. And this has been a policy decision to transfer risk onto the individuals, onto the household slowly. It's a big transition to happen from a Maibap government, which did everything, gave you a fixed return, to transferring of the risk, which means market-linked hmm. products. That's fine, but what happened in that process is that the policy decision on the market structure remained a financial disclosure plus financial literacy model, which meant that uh, individuals are rational economic agents. Hmm. They will do the due diligence, collect all the information, and then make a rational product choice, right? But um, disclosures, are legalese, they make no sense. Hmm. Financial literacy is a joke. So you've transitioned from a safe place to an unsafe place on a flawed uh, market policy logic. Okay, it's a buyer beware market and I actually argue for a seller beware market because the proposition is so tough. So that's one piece which went wrong, yeah. which is why okay. you feel like that and you should feel because it is scary. Yeah. The other piece is that we've again got into a regulation by form and not function. Okay. So when I say that, I mean, what is the function of a financial product? Is it protecting your income stream uh, as you earn so that if you die, your family is looked after through a life insurance policy? Or is it an investment or a corpus building product? Hmm. Or is it a home mortgage product? Or it's a pension product? These are functions. But when you look at regulators, they are by form. So the ULIP, is actually a mutual fund wrapped with a thread of a life cover, right. which is regulated by IRDA, hmm. IRDA, and the mutual fund product is with SEBI. Pensions are across four regulators. So you will have a mutual fund which does pension, you'll have insurance which does pensions, you have the EPF, you have, you the, have the PFRDA, the yeah. Yeah, PFRDA okay? So as an individual who's suddenly now out in the world saying, okay, you take the risk, you're saying, okay, what am I doing? Am I shopping regulators? What, what am I doing? And then you have firms, XYZ mutual fund, XYZ life insurance company, XYZ pension uh, firm. Yeah. They're all, the XYZ is the same. An individual does not know what he's buying. So there is a flawed marketplace. In, there's a policy flaw, there's a marketplace flaw, which is why all of us freeze, because we don't know what to do. There is too much choice out there. There are too many decisions to take. So you're perfectly normal feeling like that. And that is why, I, I felt the need to write this book because in conversation after conversation, people said, you know, I don't know what to do, but I wish I had, I wish I knew more. I wish I knew how to decode it. Yeah. Also, all I've done is sort of given you a sort of safe path through these shark infested waters <laughs> to say that, you know what, you will not get rich overnight hmm. with this book, but you will have a system in place. You will have far more financial control. You will have, you will, you'll have many more questions to ask when a person comes to pitch a product or a financial planner wants to uh, be your planner for a fee. Yeah, it's a yeah. preparatory book, if I may call it that. It prepares you to take yeah. the difficult decisions that you obviously yeah. have to take yeah. to put your money in the right hands. It's a habit-forming book. Okay. I'm saying that you have to change your habit from chasing return into having a system.
fair enough. We're going to get to that system in just a bit. But before that, you know, I want to talk about this regulatory bit with you without getting too technical because we're right. here to talk about the right. book and everything you advise about in the book. But what else is the option facing us versus this regulatory structure that we have? Now, I know that there's a lot of scope for improvement here. But the world of finance has become so complex. Many years ago, I was talking to the head of a regulatory agency in Australia. And we were just comparing notes on how SEBI in India looked at the marketplace uh, and you know how they looked at the marketplace. And he said, we have transitioned to understanding that we cannot save every investor right. or police every scheme right. or every product. Right. It's impossible yes. for us to do that. Absolutely. The market's too complex. So the best we can do is to create literate investors. Just make sure there is enough information out there for investors to make you know, informed choices. Mm -hmm. That seems to be what we are slowly moving towards as well, but you're saying that's not right. Uh, there's a missing piece. So the okay. Australian regulator has been one of the most proactive, hmm. which is why a lot of financial sector guys ran away from Australia because the regulator was so good. So the piece that he missed out in the middle, which is hmm. the most crucial piece, is that you make the products as transparent hmm. and as mis-selling proof as possible, hmm. then the literacy piece works. Hmm. Okay. So you will have products in the Indian market today which do not inform the return to you hmm. as a percentage of your investment. It will tell you the return as a percentage of a third number. For instance, traditional insurance policies will say, oh, you will get 105% of something. Hmm. It's not 105% of your investment. It yeah. is 105% of something else, I'm assured. Okay? So these are very basic things. It's Finance 101, where uh, I have to now pull in what SEBI has done with the mutual fund product. Okay, so the argument here is that you put all the costs in one box, hmm. put a lid on it, and allow people to then shop over return and lower costs. Hmm. Okay, it's not that difficult to do. So we are in, we've moved in the right direction. In, in at least one as regulator far as mutual, has, mutual, mutual, mutual funds right, go. Yeah. So what, and you look at the impact on the market, um, the SIP monthly Explosion, number is yeah. seven and a half thousand crore a month okay yeah. so you get the product structure right retail investors will come hmm. and so before the literacy piece there has to be a, a product structure okay where you are labeling things very clearly Fair. you yeah. are making the product comparable so disclosure means nothing to me if I can't compare your product to the other yeah right so this has to come first then we can talk of literacy. And literacy is more in terms of informing people on what questions to ask. Hmm. It is not throwing a hundred page of a document to say, here, read this. Or really tiny print yeah, like, at goodness. the back of something yeah. that you're reading and trying yeah. to make out. And it's densely Correct. written yeah. with no grammar, no sentence structure, yeah. and you have no idea have what no risk idea. you're signing up for. Right. So it's really about, uh, you know, it's like a car manufacturer telling you here are five cars you lift the bonnet and see which one is safe it's as bizarre as that yeah, which is why it, it gets me riled up you so seem to be a little bit complimentary of where mutual funds right. have gone from a regulatory point of view but you hate the insurance <laughs> business don't you i'm going to quote something you said from the book that stuck with me yeah. you need to treat the insurance industry and those who sell the same like walking through reptile infested waters yeah. my gosh i know it is very strong but you know, Venika, when you see stories, when you get emails, when you get calls, when you get messages from people who've been missold this product, mm. their life savings are gone. There is fraud. There is just distress because of the way this product is sold. Okay. And I, you, I have seen story after story. It's systemic. So I have done. Uh, so I've done an academic paper which is published now in International Journal where we estimated what investors lost through missold in ULIPS in the whole ULIPS scam 2007 okay. to 20, 2012. It is a 1.5 trillion rupees wow. was lost because it's not just the insurance industry. They are following the signal sent out by the regulator. The mm. rules are such that they allow this kind of sales. You put high upfront commissions in any product and you will get hard selling, you will get mis selling, you will get push sales. So the, pro the problem is that you have loaded the first year sales with so much commission, 40% 40, 40 of your premium is going yeah. as commission in the first year. Why do you think the persistency number, the less than half the policies are alive after five years? Yeah. 
and that money is goes to the insurance firms. So the agents so, tend to sort of push you to constantly yes. churn because every right. time you churn and buy a policy, right. the first year premium 40% goes to them as a commission, Correct. right? Correct. So it's in their benefit to get you to right. keep moving so from what, policy to policy. So what SEBI has done is that it has, got, it has gone to trail commissions. So the agent benefits if mm. you stay in the product. Mm. But the insurance regulator has resisted this for the longest time. Explain to me why, yeah. if we have, so okay, let's give SEBI the benefit of having been around for longer, mm. okay? Um, and say, if they could learn all of this mm. uh, with regards to the mutual fund market, why is this not getting transferred as learnings uh, to the insurance regulator, mm. IRDAI? Oh, I've been part of two government committees, which Swarup Committee and Bose Committee, where mm. this has really been sort of unpacked and discussed to death to say that there are learnings which the insurance regulator needs to understand and do. I think insurance has not come out of the LIC mindset. So LIC had a function, a very good function, before the markets opened up. It was the only product which would get you a long-term corpus at a time when nothing else existed. Unfortunately, I think the regulator has been informed for all its decisions, largely by the LIC kind of thought. Hmm. And that does not uh, somewhere understand the pure role of the role of pure insurance which is a term product which actually buys you protection mm. so you will have people with 10-15 uh, policies but very little actual life cover so yeah. when you ask people what is the sum assured they look at you blankly and say uh, one lakh will become five lakh no 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 what is it what what will your family get if you die you are earning this much you will need at least 10 times of your income for the family to sustain one lakh will become five lakh. you know so it's the parroting of the agent sales push hmm. and coming back to your question on why IRDA has not uh, sort of reformed I think it's a mix of um, one the LIC mindset and two a lot of uh, household money funnels into government securities through the insurance route hmm. so we've not seen that kind of pressure from the ministry performance pressure you mean um, to change rules okay. because once that happens then who buys the government bonds I mean That's I can give you a banking analogy wow. why is so why is it so difficult to have change customer protection in banking what is the uh, CRR how much uh, how much do banks have to uh, put, put away for the CRR right and yeah. where does that go it goes to buying government securities Correct, what yes. happens so it serves, self serves the government securities this market is your textbook is case of financial repression Okay. India. So it's, it's just bigger than just the regulator. Um, once you have a better tax GDP ratio, once you have more people paying taxes. So this is very broad, very policy. I believe change may be possible once that deficit number is under better control. So this is, wow. it's really okay. my personal sort of uh, uh, argument to say that, you know, I have really struggled with this uh, because I felt that going after one insurance company or one incident doesn't solve anything, mm. right? We are in free markets. Why is it so difficult to put in place a set of rules so that most of the market does what it's supposed to do and then you catch the errant uh, red light jumper? Yeah. You know, I, I want to ask, I know we'll never be able to cover all of it, but what are the most common forms of mis-selling you've seen in mutual funds or insurance that will help illustrate our conversation because otherwise we just sound very technical talking about the structural right. issues in right. this marketplace, right? right? right. Um, uh, when, so let's, let's look at mutual funds. Hmm. When someone is coming to you selling a product simply based on its past returns, it's hmm. a red flag. Okay. Okay. You are just not chasing returns. There are a variety of other things which you need to understand. Okay. There are different products in the mutual fund offering which do different things for your portfolio. Okay. There are products which will take you, uh, which will fulfill a need which is six months later, hmm. which is one year later, which is three years later, which is five years later. You know, there is a whole tenure linked decision on investment product buying which hmm. no, which no agent or seller will tell you. So if he's only talking about last year, May, Chobis percent dia. That's a red flag for me. So I don't want a, to hear it's that. It's a red flag if, if it's the only point being it's made. It's the only point being made. But by itself, is, it's not a bad point. No, because absolutely. how else do you check Correct. what the performance of that fund manager has been in the right. past? So, right? f uh, so I'm saying return and performance is one piece that is important. But hmm. it's not the only conversation. Hmm. A tax break is a piece 
but that's not the only conversation the product has to solve a problem that i have hmm. okay it's not just that i'm buying a product because it's giving a good return you will always lose because uh, last year's winner may not be tomorrow next year's winner we're mm -hmm. looking at past performance to predict future return we don't know so i'm perfectly happy if my fund is giving me top quartile returns which means it's amongst the top performing uh, funds uh, 25% of the funds in the market yeah. it's in the top 25% I'm perfectly happy with that. The, uh, the other thing I've noticed is, and, and there are a ton now of personal finance experts, wealth managers, call it what you may, even if you have no mm -hmm. wealth, you have a wealth manager calling you, telling you how you need to buy the next mm -hmm. big hot mutual fund mm -hmm. scheme, right? Is that also a red flag? Someone who constantly is telling you, hey, get out of this and get into that right. because your returns will be better. Before you start buying uh, market-linked products, you need to understand them. Mm -hmm. So if you're buying something called a managed fund, which means there's a fund manager making calls on stocks and buying them, um, the mutual fund is charging you something for that. Right? So, um, it's, uh, so he, the minimum he should do is beat the Sensex. Okay? Let's yeah. take Sensex as the benchmark. The minimum he should do is beat that. Uh, if you don't want the fund manager risk, as we say, there is something called the index fund or the exchange traded fund for right. long-term equity investing. That's the lowest cost way to do that. The only reason that I would change a fund would be that I see that there's been some change in the fund house. The fund manager has changed or the fund has been sold or the performance has really dropped off. Hmm. Right? That's the only reason that I will switch out of a fund and get into something else. The trigger is not that I have reached the return that I want but something has changed that uh, mm. tells me to switch out of something that I had bought for the next 15, 20 years. Okay, and something so has that changed that disaligns it or misaligns it with My, what your yeah, goal was, right. your original goal that, was. And the other thing is how many funds should you have? In every, so in a portfolio you will have various categories of funds. For every category, not more than two schemes, right? So if you have say four categories hmm. of you have short term needs, you have medium term, you have long term needs. In each of those, not more than two schemes. Because the problem is if you have 10 schemes look targeting a corpus 10 years later, you've pretty much bought the Sensex hmm. in the sense that your dis diversification advantage falls after five to six schemes. Okay. You may as well then buy a cheaper ETF Hmm. For a fraction of the cost. Okay. Okay. So the this, this, this like this is just logic. No, it it's isn't. Math. <laughs> I wish we all spent time doing this to ourselves, but we didn't. Okay. Yeah. That's mutual fund mis-selling, insurance yeah. mis-selling. What is the most common kind you've come across? The most common and the most harmful is to sell a regular premium policy as a one-time FD. Okay. Okay. And this is, I mean, it happens to person after person, single parent, drug targeting, uh, it, the, it's documented in my book, it's a real story, targeting a son's uh, f uh, foreign education two years later is visited by her bank who says, oh, this is a, it's like an FD. She puts in a few lakh and next year, sure enough, the renewal premium notice comes. And she says, but I thought this was just a one time. No, no, you have to fill for five years. She doesn't have the money. She actually needs it two years later. And uh, so this kind of lying. That's fraud. It's but lying. It's so I'll tell you why. It's this fraud. It's outright not revealing the full details so of the So that prior. is where I have a big issue with the insurance regulator. Because he, the regulator then says, but you signed the contract. On the, so the assumption is you would have read through all of yes. this. Yes. But by the, the time the contract comes and the person is sitting across the table and I'm telling you, I'm your friend, I'm your relationship manager, you sab manage ho jayega, aap sign karo. Who do you believe? What do you do? Right? Yeah. So the regulator says, but you signed the contract. And this whole verbal sale which goes on is talking about all of these things. So Are you too pro-consumer or investor? Because look, if you sign the contract and if you didn't bother to read what the contract had and you're putting your money away bl with blind faith into some, some stranger's hands, then really you are a chump, aren't you? But uh, have you tried reading an insurance contract? Oh. For an average person to decode that document, it's got better and better in terms of there's better disclosure and all that. But my God, what it used to be earlier. 
was really difficult to read. How do you figure out what they're saying? Monica, you insist we should all talk money. So that's exactly what we're going to do now. I, you laid out about, you know, several, several interesting bits in your book that become, um, how do I put it? the cornerstones of our financial life. I've picked some because we can't cover all and I want people to be able to go read the book as well uh, that I'm hoping will enthuse people enough to want to go read the book. So let me start with the first one. We don't need a lot of money first to start investing. We need a lot of money streams. What does that right. mean? Yeah. So one of the things which constantly comes at me when I start talking about what I do is, oh, I don't have money to invest or I'm too poor or where is the money? And so my pushback always is because you don't think you have, that's why you need it most. Mm -hmm. Who needs uh, a gym workout more, a fit person or an unfit person? Mm -hmm. right, so if you already feel that you're not on top of your financial life, of course you need to start planning. The poor woman who sells something outside on the road has savings. Okay, Everybody has savings. So it's just sort of, it's a defense mechanism to say, um, I don't have enough money. Mm. Right? So everybody has the money and when you start uh, totaling it up people discover they had a lot of money in different accounts in different products in real estate gold so they when they collect it all together they really said oh my god actually I had that much so yes you don't uh, you don't need a lot of money to start investing but the goal is actually to have a money box which has a divorce uh, di diverse set of money flows coming in when you retire so the whole point is that as you earn through your life. Mm. For people like us, it's that salary, which is that big pipe flowing into our money box. Okay, it's going to take care of all our expenses. Out of that, we do the savings. And at some point, we do retire. Okay, we want to get financially free. So more than even retirement by force, which is when you get too old to work, there's also this concept of being financially free. Mm. To be able to walk out of a job if you don't like what you're doing, if you you know, this uh, financial freedom allows you far more dignity. Hmm. Okay, you can choose to keep working after you achieve financial freedom, but just to get to that number, where if you don't get that salary, you're fine. To reach that point, you need assets which flow into your money box, even if you don't go into work. Hmm. So that's the that's the game plan to get you to that point where you are financially free. Okay. What is a money box? So that's a concept that. You I invented sort of, entirely. Yeah, so it's my concept where I'm saying that all of us have this, you know, a Godrej box or a something at home where money is kept. So we are very used to this money box. And it helps to visualize this box. You know, uh, when you think of your financial life as a money box and you open it, do you, do you find it messy? Is there a lot of stuff all sort of bundled together or is it all nice and neat? Mm. Okay, so I like my life nice and neat. Okay, mm. It's a little bit of a problem, but it's like Evidently. nicely <laughs> neat in little boxes. In contrast to many of us <laughs> in this office. Yeah. Mm. So then when you think of a box like this and you open it, and it co it's got little boxes, squares, cells inside mm. of that, then each of those cells has a purpose. Okay? And once we've sort of constructed a neat money box, then you need to only open it twice a year to clean it up just a bit, something has moved, something needs a change, and you have aged, uh, a goal is approached and is near, then you tinker with it. But when you visualize a money box, you're basically changing your habit of not having a plan to having a plan. Okay. So it just gives you sort of a physical thing to think about, that there is a money box, it's got little boxes inside of it. Each box has a product or a, uh, a strategy. Hmm. that you need to implement. What are those boxes? Okay, so the first one... The book, the book lays them out, the give book us lays a hint. So yeah. I will just start with something which nobody who comes to sell you a product will start with. People when they come to sell you a product will say, how much do you have to invest? Hmm. This is the product. I'm saying this is at stage six. I will not even get to it before I've done a whole lot of other things. The first thing that I do, and I recommend people do, is to have a cash flow system. My okay. first box is cash flows. And we think cash flows belong to the businesses, to the entrepreneurs, but it also belongs in our salaried lives. Because when people come back and say, I don't know where my money goes, it's because you've not separated out your spending from your saving. Mm. So all that my cash flow system does is it separates out into boxes again, neat boxes, bank accounts, mm. the money which I will spend and the money which I will save. 
Hmm. Uh, most of us have more than two bank accounts because we've changed jobs. So we will have at least three bank accounts. I'm saying now label them in your head. And then I draw upon behavioral economics hmm. to s say that when you label something, you stay with that label. So the first bank account is my income account, where all the incomes, where, whether it's salary or it's rent coming or it's some dividend bonus, it all sort of flows into this one bank account. We all know approximately how much we spend every month. Hmm. So at the beginning of the process, you transfer that much and a little more to a second bank account. Okay. Whatever is left to transfer it to the third. So the second one is called the spend it account. You're going to spend only out of that. And the third one is called invest it account. OK. You use you that not. for all your investments. Yes. Quite obviously. So right. So if, you are, uh, if you're at a stage where you can do this with two accounts, then your income account and your invested account can still remain the same. Just move your spending out. Okay. Once your uh, invest it account begins to get infusions month after month, hmm. At the end of six months, you will suddenly say, oh my God, I did not know I could save so much. Hmm. I've not even begun to invest. I'm saying just let it sit. We have a 30, 35, 40 year working life. I'm okay with six months that money earning 4%. Especially since you haven't done anything before that, right? right if so you're at that stage. That's right. So if you just separate out and when you've got, when you've labeled it like that, then nothing will encourage you to pick out of the invested account to buy a gadget. It'll, our behavior will prevent us. So you'll only use it from your spend account, and your spend account, if it's, uh, you know... It's empty, it's empty. Yeah, depleted, then it's empty. That's right. Yeah. You will never find yourself pulling it out of your invested account to fund a, a impulse spend. If it is, you, that's your red flag. So this, but yeah. cash flow is just one box, right? Yeah. One cell. Correct. How many such cells yeah, are there, there in your there money are 11 box? 11 cells. 11 cells. Yes. What are the 11? Yeah. Do you remember so, all of them? Yeah, the so I will, cuff? Yeah. I'll just sort of Sorry. take you through a few yeah. of them. So first, of course, is cash flow. That right. is where you begin. You don't begin by investing. Okay, got it. Then what, what you need really is something called an emergency fund. Okay. Because again, when I speak to people and they say, no, no, we can't invest in equity because you know what? What if we need the money? Hmm. No, and it's a genuine fear that I may need the money soon for an emergency for yeah, something. If you have aging parents or something you, know, you need. Children so I'm about saying, to get married or go off to study. Yeah, those are goals. That. Those are different. So okay. th though you can target those goals. This aging is just, parents, health emergency? Yeah, so you can target those. Again, okay. goals can be targeted. See, <laughs> those are goals which can be targeted. This is emergency. I lose my job. I hmm. have an accident which my insurance is not coming. There are 100 things which can go wrong. Yeah. This is just emergency money. Okay, this clearly is six I got this months, bit wrong. Yeah. Six months of your monthly spend. Six months of your expenditure. Expenditure. Wow. Is put away. That's the first sort of investment that I make. So after you make, make sure you've got your cash flow thing yeah. working yeah. fine and you've and got this you money piling up in your investment yeah. account, yeah. the first thing you ought to be doing is, is putting away emergency. at least six months of money. Correct. That's uh, the first thing that you do. Okay. Right? Because, and then you will buy your insurances. There's medical, there's life. And if you see all, what is all of this doing, this is now allowing your money to take a longer term horizon. Okay. Because we've sort of dealt with an emergency. So emergency happened. And again, these have happened in my life where somebody's lost a job and you suddenly need the money. There's EMI. I had one year of expenses sitting in a nice short term fund. And then you don't need to sell your house or sell your car or move, you know, or do take, something. Or take a take job on, out yeah, of desperation. Correct. You right? have the time to wait it out. So what your emergency fund, your, what your medical insurance, what your life insurance, all of these are um, accounts or are cells which in an emergency will fund you hmm. so that your money, what is now left for savings long term, can actually go to equity. Because okay. equity is a long cook. It's a very long term. It's not instant noodles. It's a long term cook. Uh, your money can now take the risk and stay long term. You will not need to pull it out because you've done all of this. Okay. I counted in your book three bank accounts in the cash flow yeah. cell, <laughs> five types of insurance, health, yes. life, critical illness, accident, home, three types of investment cells, one yes. emergency account, one, one retirement, retirement account. account. Oh my gosh, by the time I got through all of this, yeah. I was tired and exhausted yeah. thinking, my God, do I have to plan for all of this? Can't yes. I just pick up what I save and put it into some SIP and be done <laughs> with this? But I can't, it seems, or I should so It really depends on your uh, personal situation. 
right so if um, you know if you have no goals for say children their marriage their education um, you know that you will retire in you know that that is the only goal that you have is uh, care of aging parents and yeah. uh, your own retirement it's a far neater life than somebody who's got a messier life with children and um, parents, parents children. children all of that yeah right but even a person like you would need your emergency fund you will need your medical insurance but emergency retirement cash flow five types of insurance yes. i have like health insurance thanks to my company yeah but Home what Cover, happens which i now discovered is really not enough right Correct. when i was reading your book right three what types happens? of investment cells with three yeah. different time goals and all of it you know look are you not scaring people like me away no, so i'm telling you what uh, you need to know if you go to even work with the planner and right? so if you go to work with the financial planner you should know that this is this is all the work that he will do hmm. this is what a financial planner does he will put your life in this sort of a matrix okay and the structure of the book is such that if you feel that this is far too much work and i don't have that many short term goals hmm. then you knock off a box and say i only have long term and uh, just use the boxes that yeah, suit your so financial it's really goals. sort of it's your box you can take a cell out and say i don't have short term needs mm -hmm. i don't have medium term needs i only have 5 year plus goals mm. and then it's far neater okay. but in terms of an emergency fund in terms of your medical insurance i cannot emphasize enough that uh, you have to have your own because what happens when you leave a job and mm. you are much older by mid 40s a lot of lifestyle diseases start in and if you look for a health insurance cover at age 55 you're going to pay through your nose or not get one not get one because in any mm. case you will pay because yeah. medical insurance premiums go up unlike life insurance yeah. so you will not get one so i'm again the intention is not to scare but to say that you need these covers mm. so your office insurance is not enough people change jobs things happen and then you know people are out of a job and there's no medical cover yeah it's important mm -hmm. also i think i read in your book to break up your investment goals into timelines right Correct. what you need in the 6 to 12 months what Correct. you need in the right. or, or maybe you know 1 to 2 years 2 right. to 5 years yeah. and then 5 years and beyond right. but 5 years and beyond would be akin to a retirement account so why are we separating these out i wasn't sure why or what the purpose was um so five or you're assuming yeah. a very young start age right you're definitely so not assuming my start age no, but even because to me 5 10 years is sort of you know lines up with when i'd hope to be able to yeah have the luxury to stop working to if stop i wanted working. to yeah if i wanted to so it depends really on what your age is for a person okay. who's in his 30s the goals of children's education and marriage are beyond 5 years hmm. so they will need to use uh, the money for a variety of goals the kids and their own retirement for a person like you it is pretty much retirement right you know so yes so what is be, uh, what is beyond 5 years is really for you just retirement but there are other short term goals for instance for a person whose child is going abroad say next year i would need the money next year and i cannot be in an equity fund because i have no idea what equity will do next year hmm. so that's my um, short term goal yeah i'll move it into either a liquid or a ultra short term fund so that when the need arises i can withdraw hmm. so it's really uh, it's really about when you need the money so it's not about the return it's about when will i need the money the tenure which is the point you made right yeah, up front i'm saying right? you have to match and every product comes with a sell by date a use by date hmm. right so you have to match that with the your own goal so if you if you're buying equity for a goal next year it's the wrong you should never never do that okay equity is only for a goal which is more than 5 to 7 years so you have to then so the idea of the book is to help you think differently about financial products it's been sold in a particular way for 60 years mm. but that doesn't serve me what serves me is my need my comfort i should have the money when i want it so when you use this system then the money is available and that's the feedback of all the people who are in financial planning who are using this system that uh, we feel in control the panic is out we don't go get swayed by sensex up sensex down we don't buy the next jp estate 
okay, we don't buy Rajnagar. You know, we don't yeah. get into these deals. We don't get into hurt. spots that hurt us and, you know, lose right. us money in right. that sense. Right. So. Okay, uh, you've discussed all the various asset categories in the book in great detail. I won't revisit those, but I do want to know what your rules are. So if we were to broadly look at real estate, gold, equity and debt, which covers most of it, what are the rules that you have that apply to each of these asset categories? So let me start with real estate, okay, where uh, a lot of Indians have traditionally thought that that's the one investment which will never go wrong except that what we've seen is in the last few years it has gone terribly terribly wrong mm -hmm. because of a variety of factors okay um, personally I feel that if you can't manage your mutual fund or you can't manage your financial life how are you going to manage this clunky asset called real estate mm -hmm. um, other than the one house that you live in you should have zero real estate assets okay so your exposure unless you're at a um, net worth of uh, several hundred crores where then it becomes a necessity because of diversification mm. but if you're an average uh, middle upper middle mass affluent person then other than your one house in which you live real estate has no place in my money box what were the argument that you know given the shortage of housing in this country real estate prices will always appreciate you will right. never lose money in it you know you may sometimes lose money in equity even if you go via a mutual right. fund you should talk to uh, some of the people who have invested in uh, lavasa or yeah Andy Valley so it's or builder to builder i get that no, no it's also not not thinking about the price at which you're buying so you are buying a dream Hmm. thinking that prices will always go up. Um, I want you to think about real estate if you're buying it for an investment using the same metrics that you will use for another investment like equity. Okay. So if real estate is an investment, what is my yield on it? What is my annual rent divided by market value? Right. So right now that yield is one and a half percent. I am better off selling it and putting the money into even a fixed in an deposit. FT. Yeah. Like I'm not even saying ultra short term debt fund which is giving me seven and a half, eight, it varies between six and nine, but post tax. Yeah. But so, is it old yeah. fashioned? You know, I've, I've heard so many people say this, yeah, but you know, you have the solid asset and then it earns you rent yeah. and it appreciates the There's maintenance, there's the fear of the tenant not leaving. Then there is all the problems that real estate causes with inheritance of uh, what mess you leave behind for your kids. So in your so, book, not just this one, but generally yeah. speaking, in your book, real yeah. estate is yeah, a no-no. Yeah, and also, um, the more, uh, the smarter financial people who are actually understanding this are saying, I'm not buying this messy asset. Because one, it requires black money still. Hmm. Two, there is a whole lot of costs associated which you never count of maintenance, of stamp duty. If you're buying investment on a loan, and you're getting a yield of one and a half, two percent. You're silly. What are you That's doing? That's the politest way we can put Yeah. You know, a large number of people today are choosing yeah. not even to buy the house that they live in. Right. This is the millennial. Is that the smart thing to do? It's the millennial. Like if, yeah, if I didn't need a permanent address right. for my passport and all, you know, I'm better off selling the house I live in, moving on rent. I'll save like, I don't know how much Because money. it allows you to unlock all that capital. Unlock right? capital. But, but is it the smart thing to do given, you know, what, it, I mean, especially because mm -hmm. it's, it's urban millennials doing yeah. this and in yeah. urban uh, cities, you know, rents are fairly expensive, yeah. aren't no, they? And so. actually rents are low in Delhi compared to your EMI. Mm. Okay, okay, so the place that I want to live in, in Delhi, the EMI will be 4x of the rent. So it's far cheaper to live in a really nice area on a much lower rent rather than put that down as EMI. So if, if you yeah. had a, mil, you know, a millennial come to you and say, yeah. you know, I have a pool of money, but I don't want to put it in a house. Yeah. I'd rather absolutely, rent yeah. out my home. You're yeah. saying it's wise to yes, do that. Yes, absolutely. Till the time that you decide where you want to live, you buy the house that you will live in, in the place that you will, when you finally settle down, have a family. What if you never buy a house? A lot of people can think about that as well. So that's okay in your book. Yeah, that's fine. So you have to be okay with it. You have to be okay with not having a house. So what a house does, it gives you a permanent address. It gives you some sort it gives of permanency. Gives you a sense of stability. I stability. must say. Stability. Right. Maybe that's old fashioned. No, but, but it, it does. does right? Absolutely. So I have a house that I own and I live in. I like the stability. But the millennial mindset is very different. They don't want to be tied down anywhere. To an asset. So yeah, uh, if saw. you are using that EMI money to build a corpus, which you then put down as down payment, it's a smart thing to do.
Okay. Gold rules for investing in gold, if at all. Uh, jewelry is not investment, so yeah. that's off the table. Right. Um, Indian marriages require gold, so people with children, they do. So any marriage, okay. it does not matter what. You and I will sit on the table and talk, but when you go into our homes and there's a marriage, there's gold. Okay. All right. There's so always gold. Denial, huh? Okay. And so if you have kids and you are targeting their marriages, up to 10% of your portfolio, you can you can buy gold. Okay. Um, personally, I don't have any gold in my portfolio because I have only equity funds. I think when I, if and when I want to buy gold, I'll buy, I'll redeem and buy then, rather than have this asset on my portfolio. But uh, just because of higher returns, right? Yeah, higher returns. Gold really doesn't give you. It, it's a hedge against inflation. So if my portfolio was that large, that I needed the hedge against inflation and a, a, another asset to diversify, I would put it there. Hmm. It's really about how large your portfolio, portfolio is. is. The larger the portfolio, the more you need to put diversification assets into it. So gold comes even lower than real estate in your portfolio priorities. They're both sort of vying for the bottom position yeah, somewhere. Okay. Like, <laughs> I'd rather wear the gold and enjoy it rather yeah. than invest or in gold. Or not wear it. I'm happy wearing okay. gold. <laughs> debt. <laughs> Rules of investing in debt. Um, so debt is the stabilizing part of your portfolio. It's really good to have for your shorter term needs. Mm. Right? So your uh, debt funds all fall in this category. Um, long term, if you have a debt product, I would only recommend your EPF and PPF. I don't see the purpose of a long term debt fund. If your horizon is more okay. than five years, you don't need you are far better in equity. But that is for a person who's still earning money. But for the retired, there is a product called a conservative balanced fund, which has about 75% debt, 25% hmm. equity. So my 82 year old father finally made the transition from FTs two years back into hmm. uh, because you know what FT rates fell and he was convinced that his daughter's not all completely nuts. So he's made the transition and a lot mm. of retired people are making that transition. So the role of debt in a retired person's portfolio then becomes the stabilizing asset class with a little bit of equity for the return kicker. Mm. So again, when you use asset classes, it's really about who you are, what your stage is, how that asset will help me. Right? So the rules will actually keep changing according to age and stage. Yeah. Yeah. Equity. Equity is like my favorite asset class. I think it comes out across in the book because. But uh, let's make the distinction: direct yeah. stock investing no, no, or no. investing mutual funds. No, no, no. For people like mutual us, funds. mutual funds. It has to be mutual funds because people like us do not have the time to sit and sift through stocks and buy the five or the ten that will do well. So you can have one success story that you picked Infosys when it was not Infosys, but then did you talk about the duds that you bought? Right. So. It's a far safer way to hand your money over to the mutual fund, fund. scheme uh, fund manager or go the index way, buy the ETF and get the broad market return. Hmm. Um, the rules are such that there is no risk of somebody running off with your money. Hmm. The costs are reasonable hmm. and because of the way the product is structured, I can compare across different products. So it gives me a handle to evaluate performance. Hmm. So long term. Uh, money is definitely in equity funds. Yeah. There is no other asset class which is going to give you the kind of return equity does. And there are very good, um, uh, you know, logical rules for that. There are, there are reasons why equity does well. It's not a lottery. It's not a punt. Hmm. And which is why in the pages that I edit, there'll never be a tip, a hot tip. It's not about that. It's really about long-term wealth creation using equity exposure through a mutual fund. Okay, there was an interesting okay. experiment that you've spoken of in your book that you did many years ago in your journalistic life to try and determine the returns yes. uh, in equity. But we won't give yeah. it away so that people right. can go to the sure. book and read. Yeah. You know, I just there's one category that you haven't listed in your book as a separate category. I might be wrong to bring it up as a separate one. It's a hybrid of equity and debt. Mm. But pension funds, mm. I, I hear a lot of people talk today about do you have exposure to pension funds? Are you invested in any of these? Um, what or how do you think this fits into the four that we've already spoken of? So it depends on 
um, are you talking of a pension fund that accumulates a corpus and then so gives NPS, a pension? Yeah, of some NPS. Sort, yeah, yeah. So NPS is a great product. For Somehow people, people refer to it as a separate sort of asset class. Yeah, it altogether, is a, right? It is, an, it is equi it is equity, equity in, in some ways. Yeah. So NPS is a product for people who are not part of the EPF. Hmm. So if you have a, a job which uh, uh, makes you a member of the EPF. Hmm. 24% of your salary, 12 of yours, 12 of the employees, always is already going towards your retirement through right. that um, product. This is for the consultants, the uh, hairdressers, the professional lawyers, the whoever is on their own, the doctor. The non-salaried people. The non-salaried people who don't have this month-on-month -month, uh, contribution towards their retirement. Hmm. So NPS is one of the routes. Right, so but you can target it yourself through a mutual fund or through the NPS. Right. So it's actually another road to a retirement corpus. Is it an either or investment choice, either debt or equity or NPS? No, no, it no, no, like no, no, no. So what bucket no. would it fall under? The equity the NPS? bucket. Yeah. NPS will sit in the retirement planning box. Okay. So there is a cell here which says which says retirement planning. When you open that piece up. Then you have to decide what route you want to take. Hmm. And you take only one route. You don't say NPSP karenge, we'll do this also, we'll buy a uh, pension plan. So, what's the insurance. route you recommend for retirement? Because I thought so you were you, you, the ideal way to plan yeah. your retirement and then work through your retirement. I mean, not work through your retirement, but work your retirement is equity, isn't it? At it least is planning. Equity. It yeah, is equity. Plan. Yeah, then Absolutely. So, so, so it is it equity is dominated equity. NPS schemes that you're talking about. Right. And also for a person who can do it himself. I would recommend don't even do NPS because you are by force, you are forced to buy an annuity. Hmm. When you vest your NPS, when you reach age, I think 60, uh, part of your corpus by force buys you an annuity. Hmm. The annuity market in India is not that well developed. Okay. So if you can do it yourself, I would target the retirement corpus on my own through a mutual fund at retirement, then use it myself. Okay. Yeah. Okay. My last question to you. And this is the classic question that you've been mm -hmm. asked about a billion times, if mm -hmm. not a trillion times, asset allocation. And of course, with that comes the concept of risk diversification. Mm -hmm. How does one work through or plan through that? The asset allocation question will get answered according to your goal. So there is no, so we have thumb rules to say that when you're younger, you can have more equity. Right? So when you're in your 30s, you can have up to 70% of your money in equity as you grow older at 70 you have just 30 percent of your money in equity so these are the broad rules of thumb hmm. that uh, the exposure to equity reduces hmm. as you get older and older and there's a logic to that because you have that many less years that you're going to be alive so that many less years for the markets to recover hmm. right? so that's your sort of base level argument which says that equity goes down as you age having said that every goal will have a different as asset allocation. Hmm. So when I speak about a retired person who wants uh, a monthly income, then his asset allocation is 70, 30, 25, 80, you know, 75, 25. Hmm. Uh, if I have a short term goal, for that goal, my asset allocation is 100% debt. If I have a long term goal, which is more than seven years, I'm 100% into equity. I have no debt in that product. Hmm. So the broad rule is heavy equity at a younger age, lower equity at an older age. But then as every goal is targeted, the asset allocation for each goal would differ. Okay. And this heavy hmm. equity at a younger age is does not stare in the face of risk diversification? Should you not be in more than one asset class? Right. You are already doing your EPF. You're already doing 24% of your basic hmm. into a government guaranteed debt product. They are doing a little bit of equity, but it's through the ETF route. It's very small. But as of now, this is your solid core of your portfolio. And at age 30 with 70% in equity, that's, that's really what you should be doing because you have the, uh, the years ahead to go through several investment cycles. Thanks so much for speaking Thank with you. us here at Bloomberg Quint, Monica, Thank and you all the best with the book. Thank you so much for having me here. Thanks Thank very you. much.